Stephanie to start the recording and let you know when she's live. When That'd we're be live. Great. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, Collingwood. I'm calling to order the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee meeting of January 17, 2022. And I'm going to start by reading out the land acknowledgement. For more than 15,000 years, the First Nations walked upon and cared for the lands we now call home. Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and many others who cared for their families and communities the way we now seek to care for ours. The, Treaty of Calling, the Town of Collingwood acknowledges the Lake simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818 and respects all of the nation-to-nation -nation agreements that have formed relationships with the original inhabitants of Turtle Island. We acknowledge the reality of our shared history, the current contributions of Indigenous people within our community, and seek to continuing empowering expressions of pride amongst all of the diverse stakeholders in this area. We seek to do better, to continue to recognize learn and grow in friendship and community, nation to nation. I'm now going to read the motion to adopt the agenda that the con content of the development and operations service to standing committee agenda for January 17, 2022 be adopted as presented. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Doherty and Councillor Jeffrey, thank you. And uh, all those in favor. And that's unanimous, thank you. Uh, this is the time when I ask if anyone has a declaration of pecuniary interest uh, to make it. And uh, just to remind you that if one arises during the course of the meeting, uh, to please announce it as soon as your conflict's been determined. Uh, as to business arising from previous meeting, would anyone have any business they would like to discuss? Uh, seeing none, uh, we're on next on to a standing item on our agenda, which is the interim control bylaw updates. Uh, and this has to do with our water capacity and land use planning study. Uh, CEO Skinner, is this your presentation tonight? Yes, I'll run us quickly through that deck this evening, uh, please, Chair. Uh, we've uh, seen this one a few times, so I'll uh, mostly mention the changes from past weeks. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the resolution uh, was an ask from council that until the ICBL is limited to make sure that the community and council had uh, uh, weekly updates in any week uh, that there is a councillor standing committee meeting on a number, all of the items listed here, exemption requests, RFPs, negotiations and the like. And we have included those in this, uh, this update today. Next slide, please. Uh, the situation is similar to as we had left it. We have a water supply that's safe and available. Uh, Council took a very proactive and transparent approach to seek capacity and manage what we have, uh, what we have left. Uh, the issue isn't one of immediate water supply, but it is about uh, making sure that we have the uh, water uh, that we need in Collingwood to grow as a complete community until our uh, plant expansion is uh, ready to go. And um, we have uh, recommended and council accepted an interim control bylaw, which temporary and tr temporarily and transparently pauses development. However, there is an exemptions process. And uh, in uh, several decisions over the past uh, three quarters of a year, uh, council has approved all the 2021 ready to go development applications that were brought forward by the folks who wanted to proceed. And most residential renovations and additions can continue. Um, in any case, if you have some work that hasn't been exempted and you want to proceed in Collingwood, please talk to our planning or building departments uh, or look at our website under Engage Collingwood and uh, you can get some guidance on uh, what can and can't proceed right now. Uh, so we have uh, maximized the chlorine um, that uh, can be added to drinking water and uh, based on some suggestions from council have agreed uh, with our excellent consultant uh, to put some new ultraviolet in the existing plant. Uh, we are getting closer to the capacity we need to meet the expected growth um, with the plant expansion completed at the end of 2025 or very early 2026, but we're not quite all the way there. 
Next slide. Uh, two halves to this presentation. The first is really about the capacity to produce water. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is continuing or what's happened recently, uh, we have um, um, I, when, uh, the three things that are noted there with the in bullets are the same as last week. But last week I had mentioned that we were going to pre-qualify up to four general contractors for the large water treatment plant expansion. And Public Works and Purchasing did confirm that three um, uh, qualified firms have been pre-qualified. Uh, they're listed there um, in the third bullet. As well, I have had in the second last paragraph, it notes that there have been some CAO level discussions uh, last week on the draft water supply agreement. Uh, we're coming to some agreement on the, uh, the final issues and opportunities and uh, we're, um, we're moving toward a final push for agreement. And if that doesn't happen in the short term, uh, we were going to talk a bit more about options to bring in facilitators or uh, more people onto the negotiating team to make sure we could push that, uh, that agreement through uh, with both municipalities. So it is at the, the highest staff levels right now. And I do hope we will be able to work out something to recommend to our two councils in the um, the next number of weeks. Certainly both CAOs see it as a major priority for their municipalities. Next slide, please. Uh, I did uh, make a couple, uh, only two changes here on this slide. Um, I did want to highlight in the uh, right side, the lower yellow circle that finalizing the agreement with New Tecumseh, uh, we had hoped to get that done in the fall. Uh, but I have updated that tag to now say winter 21-22, as I just mentioned. And implementing the reduced water supplies to other municipalities is a to be confirmed. Uh, we have put both municipalities on notice that there may be a need for a reduction. However, uh, pending uh, some of the uh, 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 some delivery, such as the interim ultraviolet in the existing plant, we may or may not need to implement uh, those reductions, but we have set it up such that all the municipalities would, uh, would share in reductions if that uh, was necessary. Uh, so that's just been moved to a to be confirmed uh, based on the technical uh, results. Next slide, please. No changes in the remaining water supply. Uh, we are at uh, 493 uh, cubic, uh, sorry, single dwelling units remaining uh, with the final decisions at the end of 2021 by council. Um, uh, if the uh, interim uh, UV as planned is delivered in 2023, we'll be able to equal out the amount available in summer and winter. And as I've mentioned before, we would move up to 1,283, that middle, middle line, middle number on the last line uh, that could be available to be allocated. Next slide, please. A second half of this update is about the land use planning policy study and the, uh, the allocation of water. Next slide. So we do have an exemptions process that was mentioned briefly. It's meant to get us through this study period. And afterwards, the allocation of water will be uh, managed pending council approval as recommended by the study. Uh, for if you have already been granted an exemption, uh, you can continue through the process and please uh, get your approvals and apply for your building permit uh, as soon as practical. Uh, if you have not been granted an exemption, any planning application will continue to be processed. Uh, we can work through those at the staff level. However, council planning decisions would follow an exemption uh, or completion of the planning study and interim control bylaw. Next slide, please. Uh, we've added uh, the red uh, lines at the bottom of this chart. Uh, we had admit, oh, provided a brief overview of this verbally last week, but we hadn't expanded the chart. Uh, but basically, this says uh, that uh, uh, we are at, um, uh, on, uh, sorry, the dates on the next slide, but in the middle of January, we have the uh, public meeting for the zoning by law, and we're right about that stage now. After that, um, there's a couple of other public meetings uh, and et cetera that are, are, are to follow with the intention um, in March to uh, bring forward the, to council the, uh, the final version of our policy, recommended policy. 
Next uh, slide, please. Um, so we are looking there in the middle of the, in the 2022 dates, uh, the next date, January 24th, will be a public meeting at council around the zoning amendment. And if anybody is looking for the updated policy uh, upon which we are also seeking uh, public comments, it's uh, readily available on the town's website uh, under the Engage Collingwood uh, button. And if you have any concerns, please uh, uh, contact Director Valentine or myself and we'd be happy to provide a copy. Um, the, the community had asked for extra time to comment. So we do have this second round uh, with council's approval and at, the, at those requests happening right now. Next slide, please. I'm not going to talk about the building statistics in this presentation because there is an update from the building department on their year end um, results uh, coming up later in this agenda. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, for the projects that did receive exemptions to proceed right away, um, there are two charts here which haven't changed from, from last week. And they show the total of the percent of, on the left, the percent of the total building permits um, uh, with exemptions by building permit status and uh, the percent of exempted projects by building permit status. Uh, but the message here is that we're inching toward having uh, built as many building permits uh, issued as could be issued under the ICBL, um, but there's certainly lots of space for more building going on in January, February, March um, in town uh, with these exemptions. And that's the end of my update for today. Uh, back to you, Chair Hamlin. Thank you very much. Would there be any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, we have one staff report on the agenda tonight. Uh, it's item 6.1 P2022-02, Radio Communications Tower Proposal. And this is a uh, property at 879 6th Street. Director Valentine, over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good evening to committee staff and uh, to those members of the public that are joining us. Uh, we do have community planner Tikal here to present his report, but before he does so, I wanted to take um, the opportunity to highlight one aspect of the uh, resolution that is before committee tonight associated with the report. And while uh, Mr. Teak will also mention this, I wanted to ensure as a reminder to committee and uh, to assist the public in understanding the municipality's role, we would uh, like to emphasize that the approval authority for radio communications towers, which is the subject of this report, is um, the Industry Science and Economic Development Canada, big long name, it used to be called Industry Canada, and it is a federal regulatory agency. So while ultimately the decision about radio communications towers and where they're located and so on, that decision rests at the federal level, the town is requested to make a recommendation as to whether they concur or do not concur with the proposal, um, which is then taken into account by the approval authority. So Mr. Tika will take committee through the details of the proposal and how it relates to the town's protocol that guides the way that the municipality reviews these applications for radio communication towers, and he will also explain the rationale for the recommendation of concurrence. Uh, so uh, with your concurrence, Madam Chair, I would turn the floor over to Community Planner Tickle. Go ahead, well, welcome. Good evening, committee. So as Summer uh, mentioned, this is a radio communications uh, tower report for 879 6th Street. Next slide, please. So the town received an application for 40 meter shrouded tripole radio communications tower located at 879 6th Street in September 2020 from Fontour International Inc, also known as Signum Wireless. The subject property contains Bygone Days Heritage Museum and is located on the north side of 6th Street, immediately west of Fisherfield Park. The tower is proposed to be located specifically at the west end of the property, west of the pond and behind and north of the tree area visible from 6th Street. Industry Science and Economic Development Canada, or ISEDC, is the Department of the Government of Canada that issues authorizations for radio communication antennas and their supporting structures such as towers. 
As the land use authority, the town makes a recommendation for concurrence or non-concurrence with the proposal, but the final decision for approval rests with ISEDC. To guide the formulation of a recommendation to the ISEDC, the town has a radio communications protocol. The applicant held virtually their required public open house on August 4th, 2021. No one attended the open house, but two landowners to the west of the subject property wrote letters of opposition requesting that the tower be sited further to the east. Town staff have also received one phone call from a resident uh, located to the south of the subject property, uh, generally in support of the tower. At the pre-consultation held in early 2020, the applicant was made aware uh, that the town was seeking the following key items to be considered in review of the proposal, the need to demonstrate coverage improvements, the need to demonstrate confirmed carriers, and that the tower design should be of a lower height relative to coverage needs and of a more stealth design. The radio communications protocol states that facilities will be evaluated on a site-by-site -site basis to determine sensitivity. Sensitivity will be measured by a variety of factors, including environmental issues, visual impacts, land use compatibility, and other community planning matters that may be significant at any proposed uh, facility location. Staff have assessed the proponent's submission against the town's protocol, as well as their response to staff comments. Next slide, please. So on, this is this slide shows one of the before and after renderings looking um, towards the mountain, so looking uh, to the west. So the town's protocol gives preference to co-location on existing tower structures. For new towers, public lands followed by private industrially designated or zoned lands are preferred. The subject property is designated rural and environmental protection by the town's official plan and zoned rural RU and environmental protection EP by the zoning bylaw. There is there are no industrial lands nearby or existing structures to facilitate co-location. The tower would be fully within the rural designation and zone and outside of the environmental protection designation and zone. Given that there is no nearby industrial land to co-locate the proposed tower and documented coverage gap in the area without co-location options, staff are supportive of the proposed tower location. Next slide, please. So on the left, uh, it shows an elevation of the proposed tower, and on the right is a, a site plan generally of the towers or a um, plan view, so looking straight down at the tower from above. At pre-consultation, the proposed tower was a 50-meter lattice trifold. Staff found this concept to be less sensitive to the context of the site, given the adjacent residential lands to the north and the existing residential uses in Clearview Township to the south, and asked for a revised design lower in height of approximately 30 meters and of a stealth design. The proposed tower is taller than 30 meters, but lower in height than originally proposed at 40 meters and a different tower height than a, or a different tower type rather than originally proposed. The shrouded tripole design that is now proposed consists of three columns with crisscrossing supports between and a screened or shrouded area at the top of the tower. Reduced tower height needs to be balanced with the direction of the town's protocol to encourage co-location. Shorter towers have a reduced coverage area and therefore a reduced number of antennas that can co-locate on the tower. Staff are satisfied that the proposed 40 meter height is justified in this location to, uh, and that um, the proposed design will hide the antenna installations. Next slide, please. And this slide shows another rendering of the proposed tower as seen from 6th Street, so looking north. So the proposed location is set back from 6th Street, the proposed location of the tower. Um, as well as future residential uses to the north, such as Links View Subdivision, which is the next adjacent property to the north. The location behind the tree area will assist in mitigating public views of the tower from 6th Street, um, which is again shown on this slide. Next slide, please. While carriers will express interest in proposals as they're proceeding through the approvals process, they will not sign on to lease space on a tower until the tower has been authorized by ISEDC. Therefore, staff do not find merit in assessing the tower on the basis of whether it will host a specific carrier, as carriers will be required to co-locate on the structure that is available, and the proposal would provide co-location for multiple carriers. The network coverage heat maps on this slide show the estimated improved coverage based on the Bell network and existing coverage on the left and estimated coverage on the right. So warmer colors indicate better coverage. Staff are satisfied there is a coverage gap in this part of town, and the proposal will be able to co-locate multiple providers and approve coverage in this area. In conclusion, staff are recommending that uh, Council approve a concurrence for the proposed tower at 879 6th Street to be provided to Industry, Science and Economic Development Canada, as the proposal responds to and is consistent with the town's radio communications protocol.
I'll pass it back to the chair. Thank you, Community Planner Tickle. Um, would there be any questions or comments from the public, Deputy Clerk Dahl? When uh, in attendance in tonight's meeting that wishes to speak, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of the screen. And I don't believe anyone wishes to speak to this item. Thank you. I'll read in the uh, recommendation at this time. That staff report P2022-02 Radio Communications Tower Proposal 8796 Street be received and the council approve a concurrence for the radio communications tower proposed at 8796 Street to be provided to Industry Science and Economic Development Canada. Could I have a mover and a seconder? Mayor Saunderson, Councillor Jeffrey, thank you. Uh, would any of the members of the standing committee have any questions or comments? Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have uh, no concern at all in principle with um, the location of this tower or indeed uh, the addition of another tower to our uh, municipality. Um, but I do have uh, concerns about the degree of camouflage that is being offered. Um, I think it's significant that in our town, uh, we do request that these towers uh, be uh, primarily situated in either industrially zoned or public lands. And uh, these lands are neither. And I think more importantly, uh, these lands uh, are adjacent to a uh, proposed significant residential development in Lynxview. Uh, and um, one can see through the, uh, the uh, renderings of the uh, height of the proposed tower that uh, it, while it is uh, um, camouflaged partly by the trees uh, from one view, it certainly has uh, no camouflage whatsoever from the other view, which would be the view from the Lynx View property. Uh, and um, uh, in addition, it is a significant presence on the skyline, uh, even in spite of the 10 meter reduction. And I am aware that uh, it, it is possible to uh, camouflage uh, such towers uh, much more than the offer that's being made to us right now. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, monopoles that would appear to be flagpoles as one alternative. Uh, another, which would be probably very appropriate for this particular space, uh, would be a monopole uh, with the um, art artificial pine tree camouflage. Uh, so um, I'm not sure if there is, if the proponent is present, um, if they can speak to that through you, Chair, or if uh, Community Planner Tico would uh, be able to address this concern. Let's start with Community Planner Tico. Have you any information on this? Yeah, so they so through pre consultation, the um, the applicants were made aware that um, the town would be looking for more of a stealth design. Um, pre initially through pre consultation, they were proposing a fifty meter complete lattice style tower, so without any kind of shrouding for the antennas at the top of the tower. Um, so staff considered the reduced height that was proposed in the shrouded tripole design to be um, a suitable proposal in this particular location. Uh, the applicant didn't come forward with, with a monopole um, design in this particular location. And uh, staff are aware that stealth designs such as ones that look like coniferous trees have been um, done elsewhere, but we haven't seen those proposals come forward here yet. Uh, through you, Chair. So uh, is it then just a question uh, for us to ask? Can you through you, to to yeah. So yeah, I mean, we can always ask. The one issue that we do have is, you know, our radio communications protocol doesn't give a lot of specific um, direction in terms of, of design or limiting height and those factors. Um, and so staff really have that as the basis of our review um, and have found that uh, this particular proposal aligns with that protocol. Councillor Doherty, any follow-up? 
Uh, no, thank you. Would any other uh, committee member like to comment? I'll comment briefly. Uh, the issue raised by Councillor Doherty is also one I have been worrying about. And uh, I know that the uh, design with the tree look, if I can call it that on top, is uh, I've seen them in Town of the Blue Mountains and you do see them around and they're not, uh, you know, to me, they're just there and we should be asking for it. Um, do we need to have a motion, I guess, Deputy Clerk Dahl, to ask staff to investigate this further and make a specific request? of the proponent or can staff just take that direction? And through the chair to the committee, if you're looking for direction from staff, then a motion is required, yes. Councillor Doherty, did you wanna make that motion? Uh, yes, I would be delighted to move that motion, chair. Okay, I'll second it. Any comment? All in favor? Oh, Count, um, Mayor Saunderson, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, and through you to staff, Madam Chair. I'm wondering uh, if there's any time constraints on this one, uh, on this application, um, certainly from an economic development aspect, and given the numbers of people that are working from home, I wouldn't want to see us being uh, delaying this request for too long. So I'm just wondering what the time constraints would be on this. Community Planner Tico. Fair to the mayor. So we're, we're certainly beyond um, the time frame that we're, um, we aim to endeavor for when it comes to review of these that set out in our protocol, which I believe is 120 days. Um, though their uh, um, public consultation wasn't held until this past August. Um, so, but Industry Science and Economic Development Canada really does rely on the town to um, issue a concurrence or non-concurrence before they move forward. So in terms of the ISEDC moving ahead, um, without a concurrence or non-concurrence from the town uh, would be unlikely, is my understanding. All right, uh, thank you for that. And I guess uh, just then as a follow-up, um, is there a timeline in which an application to the, uh, I, I'm not gonna get all the letters right, the IEC, SDC or whatever it is, uh, would expire or what uh, is the time frame? Because my understanding is this was first brought forward in uh, summer of 2020. So through the chair, uh, so the timeline that's in our protocol aligns with the guidance from ISEDC um, that requests a concurrence or non-concurrence generally within that time frame. Um, however, they don't seem to move ahead when there hasn't been a concurrence or non-concurrence um, from a municipality in that time frame. in my experience so far. Okay, thank you for that. I guess by way of comment, I'm certainly in favor of looking at ways that we can camouflage these uh, moving forward. But for this particular application, given the fact uh, the passage of time, uh, I won't be supporting it uh, in the context of this particular application. Thank you. Councillor Jeffrey, did you want to uh, add a comment? I, I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. I I think that I would uh, concur with the Mayor's comments in terms of understanding the critical importance of getting things moving for people working from their homes and um, remotely. Um, but I'm just wondering if we can combine the two, send the concurrence with, but recognizing the time challenges that if a uh, further consideration could be given um, to the further camouflage through uh, either the, I think though, I think we've asked this question before with respect to that pine tree camouflage. And I think it's for really, really high high towers. I haven't seen them on the shorter ones, but maybe that's the whole point. Um, but anyway, um, I'm inclined to want to vote in terms of getting it going and, and just ask on the back end uh, if there's any other way of making it a little more um, stealth. So. Thank you. Uh, my, I would like to ask a question of community planner Tico. Um, the mayor has indicated that we've had this application since 2020, and is this the first time it's come forward to council for consideration? Through the chair, yes, this is the first time that this application has come forward um, to standing committee and council. Um, so they, they did apply initially in September of 2020, but they didn't undertake their public consultation until August of last year. So that was part of the, the delay in terms of getting this before 
uh, standing committee and council. Okay, so this the delay's been on their shoulders, not ours. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments then? All right, Paul in favor of Councillor, Do oh, sorry, Deputy Clerk Dahl. So we had a motion on the floor to refer back to staff uh, for to further investigate the camouflaging ability. Um, is that one withdrawn or I'm just um, confirming? No, it's still on, it's still proceeding. I okay. think that's what we were gonna vote on now. Okay, great. Okay, all those in favor? And opposed? And that fails, thank you. Uh, okay, so now we'll vote on the uh, recommendation for the staff report that's in the staff report. All those in favor? Uh, oh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, yes. Sorry, um, I was Kathy Jeff or Councillor Jeffrey putting forward an amendment to uh, request further consideration given to camouflaging in the main motion? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, and to the Deputy Clerk, um, I would like to add the ask with the concurrence, but um, in a way that won't hold it up. And um, I think we need a mover and a seconder before we can amend it anyway to get the original recommendation on the floor. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. I have, sorry, I have Saunders, uh, Mayor Saunderson and Councillor Jeffrey as the mover and seconder for the main motion. Okay, all right. So thank you, uh, um, Deputy Clerk Dahl. Then I would amend that we simply add to the concurrence the ask for a more stealth, um, an enhanced stealth uh, design. All those in favor? Oh, sorry, was there a seconder for that? Mayor Saunderson, thank you. And uh, Councillor Doherty, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I apologize if I'm late asking this question, but you know, asking for uh, a um, a relook at the stealth component. Uh, I mean, how long would this actually take? This would have to come back to council on January 31st, which would provide another two weeks. Uh, so uh, I don't see that this would be uh, creating a significant delay, but I think the message would be a little bit stronger to the proponent that we, yes, we are interested in improving telecommunications, but uh, not at the expense of the aesthetics of our community and particularly our residential areas. Community planner Tickel, is this uh, reasonable to expect our applicant can look at this in the next two weeks? I can't speak for the applicant, um, and I, I guess I would perhaps raise the the notion that public consultation has occurred for a certain type of tower design. Um, so there is that aspect of it that. Um, you know, whether we, they may need to return to the public um, with a revised design, um, given that they've already consulted with the public about a, a specific design. Okay, thank you. Any follow-up, Councillor Doherty? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. So it seems to me that here is yet Another reason just to refer this back to staff to find out if this is going to create a significant delay or not. Okay, thank you. I think we've already voted on that, however. So, um, so we're now voting on, uh, would anyone else like to speak to Councillor Jeffrey's motion amendment? Councillor Jeffrey. Actually, I'm wondering if I shouldn't withdraw it because if we thought it might require going back to the public again on that ask, I would simply be supporting the concurrence. And I, if Mayor Saunderson is okay, I just think we should withdraw the amendment. I'm fine with that. Okay, thank you. So now we're uh, voting uh, on the recommendation that uh, staff has put forward to uh, provide a concurrence for the one we've, the design we've seen in the staff report. Okay, all those in favor and opposed, and that fails, thank you.
All right, thank you everyone. Uh, so we have um, on item number seven, uh, the Collingwood Heritage Committee meeting minutes. And this is for December 7. Yes, CAO Skinner. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just uh, was wondering, um, the uh, with the uh, um, the failure of the mo of the main motion, the consequence of that does that mean um, uh, we are uh, not approving and not concurring with a tower in this location, which would mean no tower, uh, or is that mean that we are asking staff to uh, to do something? differently, uh, perhaps the, the clerk or um, uh, I, I just wasn't sure what the next step was with the failure of the uh, of the proposed motion in this report. Deputy Clerk Dahl, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So through the chair of the committee, because uh, the motion was not carried, it was defeated. Um, this will go to council as a non-concurrent um, support of the committee and then a final decision will be made at the council table. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. We're now going to consider the uh, Heritage Committee meeting, minute, meeting minutes of December 7, 2021. And I'll read in the recommendation that the minutes of the Collingwood Heritage Committee meeting held December 7, 2021 be received and the recommendation contained therein be approved. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Doherty, thank you. Uh, would the standing committee have any questions or comments about these minutes? No, seeing none, uh, can we have a vote then on the recommendation? All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. So we have a consent agenda, which is item number eight, uh, which is the next matter. The recommendation we have before us is as follows. The council herein received the general consent agenda and further that the information and opinions provided in the general consent agenda items are that of the authors and are not verified or approved as being correct. 8.1, Heather and George Powell. This is the Sunset Point drainage and traffic concerns. 8.2, Rupert Kindersley, with respect to the municipal sewage overflows and September 23rd, 2021, Collingwood overflow. And lastly, 8.3, NVCA board meeting highlights, November 22nd, 2021, and December 10, 2021. Could I have a mover and a seconder for the consent agenda, please? Mayor Saunderson, Councillor Jeffrey, thank you. All those in favor? Please raise your cards. Thank you, that's unanimous. Uh, would the standing committee like to pull any items on this consent agenda? Councillor Doherty. Uh, yes, thank you. Item 8.1, please. Okay, and uh, I also would like, uh, oh, Mayor Saunderson, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to pull uh, 8.2 and 8.3. Okay. Well, that's, I want to pull some of those as well. So they're all before us. Um, so let's start with 8.1. Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, this would be uh, through you to, um, it, if we have anyone from Public Works, uh, if not, then through you to CAO Skinner. Um, uh, the um, issue of drainage at Sunset Point and uh, speed of traffic at this location has been flagged uh, with a request for follow-up from the writer. And I'm just wondering uh, what staff will be doing to follow up on this inquiry. Thank you. Director Slama, can you answer uh, those questions? Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, I can uh, answer those questions from uh, through you to Councillor Doherty. So uh, first, I would like to thank the Powells for bringing these items to our attention. And as mentioned by Councillor Hamlin, 
There are in particular um, some drainage, stormwater drainage issues in the location of Niagara Street, St. Lawrence and North Albert Lane, and also some traffic concerns. Um, in the letter they speak to kind of specifically the intersection of Niagara Street and St. Lawrence. Uh, so I'll speak to the stormwater aspects first. So operationally, we are aware of some drainage issues in this area uh, because this has been uh, mentioned by other residents and we also saw um, in the latter part of 21 a letter from the committee of adjustment so uh, operationally we are we are uh, looking at that area and the catch basin and uh, drainage infrastructure that's there and public works um, has made a commitment to investigate uh, that area in the spring and see if there's anything that uh, can be done to help with some improvement. Uh, within the engineering department uh, regarding stormwater and overland flow, uh, the group is going to be bringing forth the results of our phase one of the stormwater master plan in Q1 of 22. And this work included the creation of a stormwater model and it also includes riverine flooding and it, and it spans the, um, the entire town. So in 2022, we're gonna be working with our consultant to complete phase two of our stormwater master plan. And this will include investigation into stormwater scenarios that are, have been identified through the model and, uh, and determining which areas of, are of greatest risk uh, for our residents in the municipality identifying projects to improve our, our stormwater management uh, infrastructure, and then also the prioritization and funding for those projects. So it's going to touch uh, a lot of these different aspects. And Manager Valak is aware of the concerns in this area, and uh, they will be reviewed through the study that will be completed later this year. Also, Manager Valak will be uh, meeting with uh, representatives from the planning uh, department and the Committee of Adjustment to uh, discuss some of the issues that they brought forward um, at the end of 2021. So we're going to be uh, speaking with them in February. In relation to the traffic concerns, uh, I, we have included in the 2022 budget, engineering is going to be completing our townwide road safety review. And again, uh, through that town ride review, this location uh, will be looked at. So um, as Councillor Doherty mentioned, Sunset Park uh, is a beautiful park and it spans a lake, the length of St. Lawrence Street. And through this town wide review, it may be a location where we find that uh, lowering the speed limit or traffic coming or calming or some other measures uh, may be best to improve the area for active transportation as well as residents and uh, vehicular traffic. So those were um, the two things that I wanted to um, mention with respect to the items that were raised by the Powells in their letter. Thank you. Uh, any follow-up, Councillor Doherty? No, thank you very much. We'll look forward to uh, hearing uh, how these two projects progress. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on this item? Okay, um, so the next one uh, is the uh, Rupert Kindersley Municipal over Sewage Overflows. Mayor Saunderson, you had this item, Paul? Good, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, through you to uh, Director Slama, I just, I wanted to uh, get some context for Mr. Kindersley's letter. He is representative of Georgian Bay, uh, forever.ca. And uh, so uh, when uh, we received his letter last November, uh, I did respond at the time, but uh, was hoping that uh, Director Slama perhaps could give some context about this particular overflow event, uh, how often they occur and what impacts they have on the water since we do draw our drinking water from Georgian Bay. So um, Director Slama, if you can help us out on that, please. Thank you. Sure. Uh, through Chair Hamlin uh, to uh, Mayor Saunderson. Yeah, so this was incident, uh, this is a bypass incident that occurred in September. And uh, we were one of many municipalities that uh, saw increased flows at their wastewater treatment plants. And uh, for us, uh, as the flows increased, it was a very um, 
uh, a high amount of precipitation over a long period of time. And I believe our previous bypass at the plant happened in 2020, uh, where we saw um, high precipitation, but over a shorter period of time. And so for this one, because it was uh, a little bit longer, 32 hours, I think it was, uh, we had a, a partial bypass. So first, we're always trying to um, uh, allow as much of the wastewater to go through our complete plant process as possible. So our uh, wastewater plant uh, has a peak design of just over 61 megaliters a day. And in this incident, we were, we were trying to uh, flow over 70 megaliters a day through the plant. Uh, then we had a partial bypass where we weren't, uh, our disinfection system wasn't um, doing complete disinfection. So we needed to add uh, chlorine to enhance the disinfection of what was going through the plant. And then as the flows continued, we did have to bypass at the front of the plant. So that is uh, sewage or wastewater that did not uh, go through any processes in the plant and went directly to the bay. So, um, of course, this is uh, a spill that's reported to Spills Action and the Ministry of uh, the Environment, Conservation and Parks. And um, we were able to limit that as best possible. Uh, we also have um, operationally, we're able to look at uh, doing some bypasses at uh, the Minnesota sewage pump station and at the Black Ash Creek sewage pump station. So that day we tried to bypass at Minnesota to see if that might help alleviate some of the flows because we were seeing some uh, backups and surcharging in the wastewater system uh, in the area of uh, the shipyards and on First Street. So uh, that was kind. Of, that was our scenario uh, that day, um, and. Yeah, as, as I already mentioned, right, we were one of many municipalities that had that situation uh, in September uh, with that, with that uh, storm uh, event. And uh, I think we did a good job of doing what we could to keep as much as we could going through the plant. What I will, um, if I may, I, I would like to touch and, and note that um, following that event, right, engineering and environmental services, um, you know, we're talking about because engineering kind of what looks after the collection system, environmental services looks at the plant. So collectively, we discussed that and we considered ways that we should investigate our system. And so that we can uh, work towards improving how we handle those kind these kind of events. So in our 2022 budget, we have some projects that are related to this. And one is completing an INI study on our collection system, which is our inflow, which would be an inflow and infiltration study on the collection system so that we can see where um, excess water is entering our system and then look at the best ways to control it in those locations so it's not even getting to our treatment plant. And then uh, also Manager McGinnity has some uh, projects to look at what can be done at the treatment plant, whether we're storing a bit of wastewater um, and holding it back and managing how it moves through the plant, um, or if there's other opportunities for us uh, to limit our bypasses or limit how much we might have to bypass. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention is that in 21, we completed a service review and we had Deloitte um, assist us with that review. And part of the 2022 budget, we've um, identified an enterprise risk review, which will be led by our accountability procurement and risk manager, Michael Truman. And through this process, we're going to take a deeper dive into our services where that are of higher priorities, where we saw um, some higher risks and they were identified that way in the Deloitte study and our wastewater system uh, 
and collection system, as well as the stormwater management. Those are two services that were identified. So again, um, these projects that are being included in engineering and environmental services are gonna be a really good first steps to help us uh, work through this uh, risk review with, um, with our uh, risk manager and uh, help us identify our areas of highest risks and uh, how we can move forward to address those. Thank you for that very thorough answer. And I'm very happy to hear about the, uh, the risk management aspects because it would appear that these storms are probably gonna become more frequent. So we will be confronted with this issue, but thank you very much for that great answer, Director Slam. Would anyone else like to speak on this issue? I had a, um, I just had a quick question also of Director Slama. Uh, the review that you mentioned, the Enterprise Risk Review, will that look generally at the uh, best practices for operating this plant, the wastewater plant? And of course, I'm thinking about the issue uh, just before Christmas we had. Um, and in addition to these overflows, it would be nice to know that someone's taking a fulsome look at the whole of the operation and saying these are best practices. And is this what the risk review is going to do? Yes, thank you, Chair Hamlin. That is what is going to be part of the risk review. Okay. Uh, once uh, those um, higher risk or those priorities are identified, yeah, look at what, how, how are we operating these services? How are we providing these services? And uh, the, what are the risks associated with that? What are the best practices? What can we do better? Okay, yeah. thank you so much. All right, the next one is 8.3. This is the NVCA board meeting highlights. And I believe, Mayor Saunderson, you also pulled this. Yes, I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just through you to staff. Uh, there's a lot of very important information in these uh, minutes uh, or updates from the NVCA, including budget um, and the recent uh, regulations released by the province. Um, and so I'm wondering if um, we can either put these on the consent agenda for our next council meeting or put them under other business so that we can get uh, some update uh, from uh, Chair McLeod, uh, who can probably provide some background on that. So I would look to staff to see if what the best way to do that would be possible. Deputy Kirk Dahl, is, do we have to vote on this or can you, uh, how do you suggest we handle this? I can pull them out and make sure they're available on the next agenda for discussion. That's, okay. that's great. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to comment on uh, this matter? Okay. Thank you. We're on to departmental updates, and we have four listed here. The first one we're going to hear from Chief Building Official Miller on the year-end building stats and the zoning certificate program. And there he is, over to you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening, Your Worship, Madam Chair, members of committee and council, and those watching from the comfort of their home this evening. I'm pleased to present our 2021 building permit activity to the committee this evening. And with that, Madam Chair, we'll jump right into the presentation as we proceed into the next slide. As I proceed through the next couple of slides, you'll note that I have included the 2020 uh, stats and brackets, and that's just simply for comparison purposes. On uh, April 27th, 2021, if someone would have said, hey, Mr. CBO, what was your permit activity projections the remainder of the year? I would never have guessed that we have uh, issued as many permits and had such a strong year as we did. In fact, we issued 780 building permits and that's up 11% over 2020. The construction value was 168.5 million, and that's up 24% in 2020, where we issued 135 and a half million. So uh, very, very strong results. The construction value, that's the second highest on record for the town of Collingwood, uh, which is great. And the 780 permits is, is probably one of the top five um, amount of per building permits that we've issued in, in a given year. I have included this, this graph. It just basically shows the month by month comparison, as well as a year by year comparison. 
2019 is shown in the blue, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and in orange is 2020 and, and 2021 is shown in gray. And you'll see that we finished off the year quite strong, issuing 140 permits in the month of December alone. As we continue on the good news onto the next slide, Again, we issued uh, 446 dwellings. That's just about pretty much the same as we issued last year. The value of the construction, the construction value of those dwelling permits was 112 million. And again, that was over, uh, you know, about 44% increase uh, from last year. The 12 month accumulated dwelling starts is 216. That is one figure that is down slightly uh, from last year. And the construction value of the dwelling starts is at 77 uh, million, pretty much the same as, as last year as well. Next slide, please. We completed 4,500 inspections in 2021, and that's slightly down from approximately 4,700. I am pleased to report to the committee this evening that we did complete 100% of our building permits within the legislated time frame of two business days. So that's, uh, that's great news. We continue to do that. We've done that for, for three years in a row. So I'm quite happy and quite proud of our staff for doing that, reaching that milestone. Occupancy permits, we issued 109. Again, that, that's a stat that's down from, from 2020. And of course, we, we've, we've seen this number before, but we have issued 68% of the ICBL exempted permits issued. On to the next slide, please. So that is, is the summary of the building permit stats. It's a very, very busy year for us in 2021. And I'd like to thank my staff and the Building Services Division uh, for all the hard work that they've done. Madam Chair, I'd like to go over some of the 2021 service enhancements that our, our division has implemented as well. I believe I reported this uh, at the last committee meeting. However, we have implemented our new public portal. That's about a year ago that we've done that. And people can submit their building permit applications online. In fact, we've, we've received approximately 1,000 applications. So we've received about 99% of our applications through the public portal. They can pay their building permit fees online up to an amount of $5,000. They can also request their inspections online. Not only that, they can also submit burn permits, heritage permits. We've also assisted the PRC with uh, the tree rebate program. Uh, they can submit a bylaw complaint. They can submit planning applications through the public portal as well. And they can do this, these types of services 24 seven. They don't need to wait in line or uh, tra track through the, the snow like we're having today. So we're, we're quite excited about this new, uh, new suite of services and uh, we're looking to uh, enhance uh, the service even more in, in the coming months. In addition to this, on the next slide, we've, we've also implementing a, a new zoning certificate process, and that came live in, in January, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, folks can submit their zoning certificate through the public portal. They can pay for that as well. And what, what the zoning certificate is, it, it allows people to apply for a, a zoning certificate. Uh, you know, the planning division will do their zoning review, and they'll issue the zoning certificate. And what, what we've been finding in the last, uh, last little while is the conservation authorities, authorities have been requesting that a zoning certificate or that we confirm zoning uh, for the property and for their proposed project. So what we're essentially doing is, 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 is formally putting this process in, in, into play. So we are able to issue the zoning certificate. And on the next slide, we have a list of um, um, on the next slide, please. Thank you. And then um, some efficiencies that can be gained through the zoning certificate process. So before people submit their building permit, they need to apply for and obtain a zoning certificate. And then they come to us for a building permit. And what, and what the zoning certificate will actually allow us to do, it'll increase our building permit turnaround time. Because once we have that, we know that the zoning has been done or been, been approved. We know that the conservation authority has also issued their permit. So once we get the zoning certificate to the building permit, then we do a building code review and we can substantially reduce our turnaround timeframes. So that provides certainty for our building permit process because when people submit that zoning certificate, then they know that they'll have certainty within that turnaround timeframe. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it provides a formal record of zoning for properties. 
So again, uh, what I envision with the zoning certificate process, there's gonna be a bit of a learning curve for the public, but I'm envisioning that we can issue same day building permits for decks, for accessory buildings, for minor, minor uh, residential projects. So I, we're quite excited about this and I'm pleased to uh, report to the community that we have this up and going. We have received a handful of uh, zoning certificates and we've issued them already. This time of the year, permits are a bit slower, but uh, it, it's been successful so far. With that, Madam Chair, it's a very short and sweet presentation, but uh, definitely a good news story. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Uh, very good news. Uh, would any of the committee members have questions or comments on this report? Mayor Saunderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, through to Greg. Um, congratulations, Greg. Uh, these new developments uh, and the increasing ability to be able to do things online, uh, I think, is a great step forward. And it's been an evolution. I know this has been in the works uh, for a number of years. Um, but just going back to the first part of your presentation, um, we all know that uh, in our meeting on April 26 of last year, when we were dealing with the ICBL, we had lots of doom and gloom forecasts uh, from about 27 deputants. And, uh, and those numbers that you've given us today, year to end numbers, are quite impressive and certainly uh, go a long way to debunking. While I would agree that uh, some of the concerns were legitimate, they have proven to be ill-founded. And I know that, um, uh, sorry, that's my clock, <laughs> my, that our CAO did an excellent job in the On the Bay uh, news magazine uh, to put all of that into context. But I'm wondering if uh, it would be an opportunity for us to do a letter to On the Bay to outline uh, those developments and to show that our development community uh, was not uh, prevented from moving forward in most cases. I know there are some exceptions, um, but I think it's a, it's a good news story and something that is uh, worth putting out there. So I'm wondering if uh, through you to either Greg or to CAO Skinner, if there's an opportunity to prepare a letter um, uh, for the spring edition of um, On the Bay, just to put some of those statistics out there and maybe perhaps put those statistics on our website to, uh, to make the public aware of, of how things did turn out uh, for us on the building front in 2021. Uh, who would like to answer that question? CEO Skinner? No? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, through you, Chair Hamlin, uh, to Mayor Saunderson. Um, uh, yes, I think that uh, in, uh, in general, it is in line with the direction from Council that we've already received to, uh, to communicate our, uh, our, how we've been moving forward um, with the community uh, to, uh, to prepare such a, a response um, and to uh, uh, put uh, that type of information uh, on our website uh, if it's not already up there on the Engage Collingwood. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up, Mayor Saunderson? Uh, no, I just, I think it's a great opportunity for to get this um, good news out there and to get it into the press as well. Thank you. Well, I think Councillor Doherty had a co comment or a question. Uh, yes, I did. Um, I had a question uh, through you to uh, CBO Miller. Um, from time to time, we do have uh, complaints from our residents uh, relative to uh, infill projects. Uh, and it may be having to do with mass, height, setbacks, uh, and uh, design, um, some of which we have control over through our existing uh, zoning bylaws um, and some which we do not, but hopefully we will be able to pull in under our control with uh, new zoning bylaws that will come out of our new official plan. Um, we also have uh, questions and concerns expressed uh, by residents uh, relative to um, the uh, permit process and permit control over uh, accessory um, um, structures on in existing neighborhoods, um, one of which is 
uh, once a building permit is issued, uh, how how is it um, how is it controlled such that what is permitted is what is actually built? Okay. Chair. Go ahead, CBO Miller. Thank you. Hopefully I captured all that. Thank you to you, Madam Chair. We, we certainly understand the sensitivity with infill development. Uh, with the building permit process, I can assure uh, you and the committee that we do review the permit application. We, we make sure it complies with the zoning bylaw and, and all applicable law, and we sure ensure it conforms with the building code. So some of the tools that we have, if, if a person if, if say, for example, we issue a building permit for an accessory uh, building with storage above, uh, if we issue it for that case, then we we issue it on, on you know on that premises. Uh, they're, they're to use that as storage. We do uh, our inspectors do go through the inspection process. So they they review the building permit drawings to ensure that they, they build exactly what was was issued with the permit. So, if we find that they have not constructed, then there is, uh, there is a process that we have that they submit revised drawings, what have you, and we have to make sure that that conforms with the, the zoning uh, bylaw as well. It, with, with infill development, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky because the applicant or the owner, they, they have a right as well under the building code to, to finish that particular space as long as it conforms with, with applicable law. So there's a bit of a balancing act. Uh, unfortunately, we don't quite have the tools that, that available to us that we can revoke permits uh, just simply because it's infill development and, and it may affect adjacent properties. Uh, we, I, as a CBO, I, I don't have that tool. I, I just can't revoke just because um, it, it's negatively impacting a neighboring property just, just by the, the height and what have you. Uh, so that, that, that person does have a right to construct that. If, if we do, as I mentioned before, if we do find that they have constructed a contrary to the reviewed permit drawings, there's, there's lots of tools, but at the end of the day, they are able to submit uh, revised drawings to us. And again, as long as those revisions conform with the zoning applicable law, as a CBO, I just, there's not much I can do. My hands are tied in that regard. Do you have any follow-up, Councillor Doherty? Um, uh, yes, I guess, and this uh, may uh, require some speculation on your part, but um, how could something like this uh, come uh, better uh, under control of the uh, building permit process? CBO that is to say, uh, building what is what has been applied for. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Under the current. Uh, tools that we have, I don't, I don't think there's any more that we can do uh, uh, with the building permit process. Again, we, we vet the permit application uh, for zoning, for applicable law. Uh, we, we review the permit drawings during construction. If there's any changes, then they have to, uh, you know, they have to submit those revised drawing to us. Um, at the end of the day, if they don't want to comply, we can issue an order to comply under the Building Code Act. If they still don't want to comply, we can take them to court. Um, but um, as far as the process that we have now, I, I'm not sure if we can do any more um, th than what we, what I'm thinking, I'm hearing that we want to achieve with infill development. Okay, thank you. Yep. I'll just add, uh, Councillor Doherty, I know you and I in particular have been waiting less than patiently <laughs> for the town to be able to solve this issue. and. Uh, to my mind, it's going to fall out of our official plan review and changes yeah. to the zoning bylaw because we've got to get some control around setbacks for accessory buildings, I think. But anyway, yeah. that's my yeah. sense on this. Okay, uh, that's all the discussion on this item. Uh, the next one uh, we have on our agenda, a report from the county uh, concerning the Municipal Comprehensive Review project update and director valentine you're going to speak to this yes i am and thank you again madam chair so this committee will recall and uh, for those members of the public that are uh, new to this conversation that the county of simcoe is undergoing what's called a municipal comprehensive review of its official plan and because that's a mouthful we typically shorten that to mcr 
And the purpose of the MCR is to bring the county's official plan and uh, planning documents into conformity with the province's growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And uh, what this exercise includes is a growth management component, which has population employment projections uh, for the county and the area municipalities to 2051. And uh, for each local municipality, there is a resulting land needs assessment that looks if there's sufficient land uh, designated to accommodate that growth across the county. So the MCR does include more than just a growth management uh, discussion. And uh, there are natural heritage and agricultural system mapping pieces, as well as climate change and watershed management policy development. So the draft growth forecasts, along with the land needs assessment and some initial work that was done for the climate change and watershed uh, management background piece was released in October of 2021. And Town of Collingwood Council did provide uh, formal comments to the county on those products in late November of last year. So just as a reminder to everyone listening, the town comments included some suggestions for refinements to the growth projections and land needs assessment, and that included a 15% overall reduction in the proposed population growth for the town. The town's feedback uh, also cautioned the county around assumptions that the town would provide infrastructure to support growth in other communities without further investigation and or support to the town as a regional hub. The town provided general support for uh, work that was done uh, so far on the climate change and watershed management policies and also called for ongoing and open dialogue, as well as reasonable timeframes for both members of the public and for local municipalities to provide further comments as uh, the county proceeded through the MCR program. So in late December, the county issued a follow-up memorandum on the MCR, and the purpose of that document was intended to respond to some of the more common questions and comments that were raised through the initial round of uh, public and municipal consultation. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, county and town staff met to discuss the content of the memo, and town staff did seek some clarification on a number of matters to ensure that we could speak to it um, before we brought it before this committee to today. So the, while the memo is attached uh, to the agenda for your uh, information, uh, we'd like to highlight a few aspects that are most relevant to the town of Collingwood, if we could. So included in the memo is a reminder that uh, the MCR will provide a framework for growth management, which will conform to provincial policies and plans. But the details about how communities look and feel and how they accommodate that forecasted growth would primarily remain at the local level. The province established minimum population and employment forecasts um, that must be accommodated or and planned for within Simcoe County to uh, 2051. And then using the province's prescribed methodology, the MCR process determines the broad distribution of that anticipated growth and, and how they determine where the growth is distributed and how much goes to each area municipality, for example is um, that the consultants look at good planning principles and they do a robust socioeconomic and demographic trend analysis. And they look at the overall goals of contributing to creating complete communities where people can live, work and play. So through that uh, analysis, it has been determined that the majority of municipalities in uh, the county will not require additional designated lands or settlement area boundary expansions to accommodate growth uh, to 2051. However, the provision of infrastructure is another matter, and this does tie to CAO Skinner's earlier presentation uh, and reminds us that the county in parallel is undertaking a water and wastewater services delivery review, which she mentioned earlier. The county did confirm that the results of that review, or at least the preliminary results, will inform the um, numbers and policies being developed through the MCR process. The county also clarified uh, that growth is able to 
continue on designated lands within settlement areas, and this would apply to the town of Collingwood, which may exceed the forecast, provided that appropriate planning approvals and justification are obtained. Um, as mentioned uh, back in November to this committee, there is also a process for the province, county, and local municipalities to what we call course correct every five years. And that provides us to look again at the growth forecast and is an opportunity to adjust those projections if there may be an over or an under estimation. The, concurrent, the cur current proposed approach that the, the county is taking to the overall MCR is looking at growth um, from the perspective of two regional market areas. And the memo does a good job of explaining why the county went in this direction. And primarily, it's intended to provide uh, municipalities with more flexibility around um, the consideration of settlement area boundary expansions, and that would apply to municipalities where a shortfall of land was, was developed, um, but where an excess of lands was developed, uh, was identified, excuse me, too much land, more than we would need uh, to accommodate growth. It also provides the flexibility um, in how we might use those excess lands. So the county has clarified that they don't uh, intend to require municipalities to eliminate those excess lands, but rather they will be encouraging appropriate phasing for orderly development within settlement areas. And that's in particular to recognize uh, the current housing market and the constraints that uh, many municipalities are facing. So that in a nutshell is um, the content of the memo. There is quite a bit more. So uh, certainly we'll have an opportunity for questions. Um, but our, in our meeting with uh, county staff, they also provided some general indications around what the next steps in the MCR might be, although we don't have any formal documentation of this timeline. So at this point, it's an estimate. The county's consultants did confirm they received the comments from the town of Collingwood, as well as from a number of members of the public that live in our municipality. And they are still sorting through and reviewing all of the feedback that they received, and they will consider adjustments to growth forecasts and land needs as they see fit um, after uh, reviewing the entirety of the comments. They do anticipate that the revised growth forecasts and land needs assessment will be released in late February, followed by another workshop with County Council in early March. And then those documents will be submitted to the province, who's the approval authority for the MCR process, and the province requires a 90-day review period of those materials. Following that, there'll be a statutory public meeting, and the target is May or June for that to occur. And this will provide uh, a second opportunity, not only for uh, this committee and council to provide feedback back, but members of the public as well on the growth management products coming out of the MCR. And it will also help us inform the town's official plan update project. As a reminder, the overall provincial deadline for the MCR process to be completed is July 1st of 2022. However, the county staff did suggest that it is most likely that only the growth management component of the MCR will be completed within that time frame, and they are anticipating that the climate change as well as the watershed management components uh, will follow shortly after. Um, so planning services staff have budgeted for further official plan amendments to respond to the county's policy framework as it is updated sort of in segments throughout 2022. That does conclude our summary of, uh, of the memo and an update of the overall MCR project. And uh, just bringing to your attention, Chair Hamlin, that we also have Community Planner Wukash, who has been integral in this project with us today, uh, should you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, comprehensive explanation. It's much appreciated. Uh, would there be any questions or comments from the committee? Mayor Saunderson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and I echo your report, uh, your comments that this is a comprehensive report on a comprehensive review process, so very comprehensive, and it is <laughs> extremely complicated from what I can tell, but through you to uh, Director Valentine, um, when I'm looking at the report, it talks about uh, the rationale for dividing the county into the north and south, uh, then that would appear to eliminate the um, possibility of down designation. And uh, I know when we talked about uh, revising our numbers, 
there was a concern that that could lead to down designation. So based on what I'm reading here, um, is it safe to say that that uh, possibility, well, not possibility, but for uh, it's very likely that there won't be any down designation because of this division into north and south? Uh, through you, yeah, Madam Chair. Yeah, 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 thank you. Through you, uh, uh, to uh, to your worship. Um, so that is indeed a clarification that came out of uh, some of the questions that staff had asked, and and definitely a concern that we raised with this committee. Uh, not only staff, but all, as well our growth management consultant working on behalf of the town. So it does appear at this point, you're correct that uh, because of the north and south uh, regional market area approach, that it is not the county's intent to require municipalities to eliminate uh, excess lands, although that is uh, something that is referred to in the growth plan. Rather, uh, they will be seeking uh, phasing of urban areas so that development uh, occurs in an orderly fashion on the lands that are already designated for growth and development. So it looks like uh, you are correct in your assumptions. The one caveat I would uh, just flag for this committee is that it is the province that's the approval authority. So while we do understand the county's intent at this time, ultimately the province will have to agree with that approach. Okay, well, thank you for that. And thank you for raising that with the county so that uh, they could address it. And um, um, well, I don't know if you can answer this, but the fact that the county is taking in uh, the infrastructure needs and infrastructure demands, uh, how could that impact the possible uh, final outcome of the MCR, or at least the growth management numbers? Go ahead, Matt. Uh, on time. Yes, through you, Madam Chair, to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that is one of the outstanding questions that we did ask and uh, requested further information. And we were told that there would be additional uh, uh, information, I guess, coming forward in the next couple of weeks on how those two projects will dovetail. But the memo does indicate and uh, staff did uh, confirm that the results of the servicing review would inform uh, the growth projections and land needs assessments. So I think uh, if I'm just reading between the lines, the county is in a bit of a wait and see pattern so that they can assess the results or preliminary results of the servicing review in order to better answer that question on how it might uh, impact the overall MCR process, in particular, the growth management piece. All right, thank you. Well, I guess we'll look forward to that because it's a, a very critical piece, I think, as far as Collingwood is concerned. Thank you very much, Director Valentine. Yeah. Uh, and would anyone else like to uh, ask any questions or make any comments on this? No. I'll just uh, I'll just uh, add on on the servicing. It it strikes me that. Uh, it's one thing for the province and the county to say all this growth should come to the county of Simcoe and all the municipalities, but without the pipes in the ground and all the funding necessary to get the servicing in place, you know, <laughs> it's really doesn't mean very much to my way of thinking. And uh, I guess, and I'll ask you this, uh, Director Valentine, perhaps is it possible what we'll see is some request for funding from the province for uh, you know, the infrastructure that'll be required if they want all this growth to be in Simcoe County, they're gonna have to pay, pay for the infrastructure. Someone's gonna have to pay for it. Has there been any discussions about that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in terms of whether the county is going to make that request, I, I will uh, defer to community planner Wukash if he's heard anything. He's certainly uh, been able to attend more meetings than I have on the MCR, but I've not heard of the county looking to make that specific request at this time. Um, what uh, community planner Wukash and I did say uh, when we met uh, with the county staff is this issue is not going away for the town of for the town of Collingwood, and I suspect that our council will continue um, to raise the same concerns and make uh, perhaps even more strong comments around this issue as we proceed through the MCR. And as mentioned, we will have another opportunity to make comments um, as the uh, at the public meeting stage uh, later this year. Thank you. Community Planner Wukash, would you have anything in addition you wanted to add to that? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, I don't have any additional information from the county on, um, on servicing in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. CEO Skinner. 
Thank you, Chair. In response to uh, to your question about, uh, about provincial supports, I think uh, we have talked with the council and with the community about the uh, the expansion uh, that the water department is uh, undertaking with our, our, our water plant, and then subsequently in years to come with our wastewater plant. Uh, we've looked at the ultimate capacity that can be created at that site. And I think in the public reports, including the environmental assessment, we're looking at just over 100 or 101 uh, cubic meters uh, per day. And uh, I think that's a pretty hard limit within the, the amount of investment that, that the, the, you know, the town uh, can make. And in fact, the space on the site, the intake pipes, and um, uh, much of that capacity um, will be used by Collingwood and our current uh, um, uh, partner municipalities uh, so I think that should the uh, county need a substantial um, amount of water uh, beyond the agreements that are being uh, being negotiated right now, uh, we're talking about another order of magnitude in investment and potentially additional sites in Collingwood or other municipalities. So it is quite a large question, I think, for the county uh, to consider in this review, um, more so than just a couple of bigger pipes. Uh, it, it's a substantial question. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you uh, for all of that. All right, the next update, uh, this would be Director Slama. She's going to talk to us about ACE cabs and accessible taxi service update. Uh, actually, our transit coordinator, Chris Wisniak, is with us this evening as well. And uh, so Chris is prepared to speak to uh, this item uh, regarding ACE cabs and our accessible taxi, as well as the next item, which is uh, the transit terminal, uh, just giving an update on uh, the transit terminal for committee. So I'll pass it over to him. Okay, over to you, coordinator Wisniak. Thank you, Director Slava. Um, just as an update uh, to uh, members of the committee, um, through social media, there's been um, some talk about uh, the changes that ACE cabs have made to their, um, their operations uh, due to staffing issues faced during the pandemic. Um, on January 11th, uh, ACE cabs uh, have reduced their hours of service to 7 p.m. Um, this is largely due to a lack of staff resources and a lack of ridership um, that they've been experiencing with the stage two restrictions. Um, now, through social media, there's been a few comments uh, that look at the responsibility of the town in this. Um, we do have the taxi bylaw, which governs the issuance of uh, taxi licenses and governs the fees, um, but there's nothing that outlines what the town can mandate for a level of service or hours of service um, for taxi cabs. Um, now, ACE Cabs is also under contract with the town um, to provide the accessible transit, sorry, accessible on demand service, um, which we renegotiated um, back in 2021 um, to provide 24 7 um, on demand accessible service um, in town. Um, as part of that contract that was negotiated this year or last year, um, there was a, a clause in there which uh, did address. Um, certain changes to the contract, um, which would potentially reduce the hours of service um, for changes that may come from um, provincial or federal restrictions due to public health. Um, so currently we're uh, still operating um, our accessible service during the day um, between 6 a.m. and uh, 7 p.m. And uh, ACE tabs have uh, worked and already uh, been in contact with administration at the Collingwood GNM Hospital um, to ensure that uh, they have a number to call to be able to get um, any patients that need accessible service uh, after hours um, home if needed. Um, and this is only being offered through the hospital um, because this is one of the issues that came up uh, last year when we saw these services becoming uh, reduced due to the pandemic. Um, ACE CABS has also uh, notified us that if somebody needs service um, in the after hours and they're able to pre-book, they will be able to accommodate, but it does have to be a pre-booked um, item. Um, it can't be something that will uh, be done on demand. Um, now with all that um, and the requirements of our contract, we feel that 
ACE is operating within the terms of the contract and um, are satisfying what they agree to and what we both agree to. So there have been some comments on social media um, about the potential of extending transit service hours to meet <clears throat> the, uh, the reduction in service levels for, for cab service. Um, I, I did uh, speak with ACE cabs and you know the ridership is, is on the low end. Um, from a municipal uh, transit perspective, um, every hour that we increase service um, for a monthly cost is about six thousand um, dollars. So you know if we go till 10 p.m, it's an extra six thousand a month and we go to 11, it's you know 12 and then 18. So it can get uh, quite costly. Um, and these are items that um, are unbudgeted for um, and are not covered under our, our, our current COVID um, funding relief. Um, so that's a, a decision that uh, we could put in committee's hands, but uh, again, the costs uh, are, are quite substantial um, and it's difficult to ascertain the actual ridership during these hours um, of what would we be, we would be running service. Um, now, as you, I spoke to a committee a few weeks back um, with regards to our new on-demand service. When we get to that point, these are the situations when we're going to have that ultimate flexibility to be able to pivot and say, yeah, maybe we can throw a bus on one bus and accommodate all these riders during this time. But currently at this time, we'd be looking at fulfilling three fixed routes. Um, so again, on the average per hour of operation, we're looking at uh, approximately um, six thousand dollars per ride. Uh, now, from an accessible perspective, we're meeting our terms of the uh, AODA Act um, with our Red Cross service still in operation. Uh, we're doing about two hundred and fifty rides per month uh, through Red Cross, getting people to medical appointments and uh, to essential uh, grocery shopping and, and, and pharmacies, etc. Um, that service again is a pre-booked service um, and still operating. Uh, in a really safe environment. Uh, we've got three buses running in town um, and single rides for one person. So that is being met. Um, so um, if we're looking at increasing service hours too, we also have to consider um, staffing. Uh, these, are, these are things that we're, we're, we're very troubled by right now. Um, you can see messages I get from, um, from the Simcoe County District School Board for my kids. Um, that there's a potential for school buses not to even operate just to do staffing shortages. So if we strain our contract with additional hours, we could be also straining our labor pool um, that could affect our original service hours. So those are all things to consider. Um, the other item that we have on here is uh, the uh, update on the transit terminal security. Um, this was brought to uh, committee uh, last year as well. Um, the transit terminal is uh, a very well used facility in town. It, um, a, lot of, a lot of riders, um, a, a lot of Collingwood residents come there to uh, stay warm, especially in the weather that we've had in the past couple of weeks and over the holidays. Um, we have had some issues um, with um, certain people not adhering to public health measures, uh, which make it difficult for our drivers, our riders of transit, and people who want a safe place to be. Um, so last year we put security in there and I wanna make sure that <laughs> security wasn't there to be kicking people out and to be causing havoc. It was to show a presence to enforce um, public health measures and to make it a safe environment for people who needed to be there. And last year it worked fantastic. Um, we didn't have any altercations um, and I had such a, a large amount of positive feedback um, and as we got into the spring summer months, we didn't require it because the weather changed and uh, it hadn't become an issue. Um, so I've uh, spoken with, uh, with Director Slama and she's brought it to department heads um, and we've made a decision to reinstate those services, which should be starting uh, tomorrow. Um, I, I've also been working with Jennifer Parker um, to ensure that she's collaborating with the stakeholders um, in, in the community in healthcare and uh, through uh, the Bugsby Center uh, to ensure that we're do, making the right decisions when it's coming to these things. So we just wanted to provide um, committee and council with an update of what we're doing and where things are at. And I'm happy to answer any any questions that anybody has. Okay, well, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, would any of the committee members uh, wish to ask questions? Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to uh, Coordinator Wisniak. Uh, so two things come to mind uh, when you uh, respond to uh, recent developments uh, with the um, ACE cabs accessible service. But one of them is, is there a, a possibility, is there an opportunity here for us to uh, introduce the on-demand early just for accessible services. Um, through you, Madam Chair, to Councillor Doherty. Um, the on-demand platform hasn't been procured yet. Um, we've got a timeline for getting a contract uh, created and gone out for procurement before we even go to getting an on-demand platform. So our timeline for on-demand service is still between the six and eight month mark to be able to implement. Um, there's a lot of pre-planning um, and IT establishment um, and proposal review and all that to get through before we can just uh, move forward with implementing the on-demand service. Okay, understood. Um, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, another thought um, that I have that uh, you obviously are going to have to go back and take a look at, but uh, rather than uh, just um, um, taking on the additional expense of extending our own hours to cover what we've lost with uh, ACE cabs, if there is the opportunity for us to just um, subsidize or pay for just those services that would be provided by ACE cab cabs on an ad hoc basis until such time as we are able to uh, implement our on demand. Um, I'm just, to my mind, I'm just, I'm thinking that uh, it would be a lot of taxi rides before we would get up to uh, the kind of ex monthly expenses that you've just alluded to. Through you, and you, uh, you don't necessarily have to give me an answer now, uh, but I, I, I think I, it's worth looking at. I believe yeah, I, can speak, I can speak to it. I, I, I think that um, I, I'd want to be careful on how we do it. Um, because it becomes something that's very convenient um, and, and can also escalate quite quickly with with costs um so I, I think it's a really it's a really good idea and i i know again the innisfil model has worked well with yes uber, yeah. uber um but you know innisfil's at a point right now where they're like okay we're we're subsidizing an awful lot of rides and we have to kind of curb how much people can ride mm -hmm. Now, where we're at right now, if that's something that we want to look at, uh, it's certainly something we can explore. I think it's also important that we're working within the proper procurement guidelines, the transparency and things to make sure that we're, we're doing it fairly and openly and equitable. Um, so if that's the direction that we want to head in, I'd be more than happy to, 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 to look into that at the uh, committee and council's direction. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if I may, yeah. just one, uh, one more follow-up, Chair. Um, it's interesting that you allude to the Innisfil experience. I actually uh, took in a webinar last week um, uh, organized by the Climate Caucus, and they were looking at uh, various types of on-demand services that have been imp implemented across Canada. And uh, there was a great amount of kudos uh, given to the Innisfil model. Um, perhaps uh, some sort of at least a temporary partnership with Uber uh, in the short term might also be worth consideration. Again, I'm just, I'm putting it out there. Um, but, uh, you know, it just seems to me where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, these are the kinds of services that are so integral uh, to our community. 
Director Salma, did you want to add something to the discussion? Yes. Uh, Chair Hamlin, I just wanted to re-mention to the committee, just when we're uh, speaking about the accessible on-demand uh, service that uh, ACE Cabs does provide for the town, that um, Coordinator Wisniak mentioned that if there is someone who does need some accessible trans transport, and that's going to fall outside the hours, they can make uh, arrangements with ACE cabs and book that in advance. It's just that they're not uh, doing the, um, not doing kind of on-demand calls after 7 p.m. So I'm, I'm hoping I understood you correctly, <laughs> Coordinator Wisniak, but that's what I heard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, would anyone else like uh, to comment on this or have a question? No, okay. Well, thank you for that, uh, the detailed uh, response on that. It's very helpful, thank you. All right, so would there be any other staff who'd like to bring forward an update at this time? All right, seeing none. Deputy Clerk Dahl, do we have any public delegations this evening? We do have a couple of people in the attendees list. So if you'd like to speak to the committee tonight, if you can please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of the screen. I do have, oh, sorry. I'm not quite sure if you'd like to speak or not. Um, if, you're, if you're wishing to speak, if you could please press the raise your hand feature. Yes, he does. Okay, so I believe it's James Orr from uh, Burnside. I'll just allow him to speak. Mm -hmm. Hello, Mr. Orr, are you there? You should be good to go. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Hamlin, Your Worship, com committee members, staff, and any other attendees I may have missed. Uh, my name is James Orr with uh, RJ Burnside and Associates. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I will be brief. Uh, I'm just following up on a submission I made on behalf of Crest Point to Director Valentine and general committee on December 3rd regarding the proposed allocation policy spoken to um, earlier on the agenda tonight. Um, this letter was received and accepted at the general, or excuse me, at the December 13th council meeting on the agenda. I had a very good uh, discussion subsequently with Councillor Comey, and uh, uh, the outcome from that was a suggestion that I make a, a brief deposition at this meeting tonight. Um, so, like many, I've been following this. ICBL and associated planning study very closely uh, as a resident, but also in the interest of a few of my clients, including Crest Point. And while I'm sure that we will anticipate a fair amount of feedback uh, related to the proposed allocation policy at the public meeting on January 27th uh, from the development community, I expect that the majority of discussion will probably be around the evaluation criteria and the specific um, you know, nuances of the scoring matrix, which, which is really a consideration primarily for greenfield and major infill residential developments and, and new commercial or industrial site plans. Um, I think generally the policy has a lot of key merits and I don't intend to comment on the specific, specifics of that policy tonight, but rather on a very uh, general theme. Um, I would implore the town to consider separate allocation pools uh, from the two main categories that appear so far in the policy. Um, where of a few particular cases in town <clears throat> where there's been a change of tenants or a change in permitted uses uh, that would not trigger an application under the Planning Act or in some cases even a building permit. Um, and I just want to be, uh, I'm just concerned that in these types of scenarios, I would hate for small businesses to be caught up in, in the allocation policy where really they, they shouldn't be, uh, particularly because some of these businesses are already existing, well-established, and are looking to just relocate within the town core. Or uh, the flip side of that is cer certainly we all want to attract new businesses to Collingwood. That's, that's obviously uh, important for us. And I think we all stand to gain from that. And we don't want to have uh, situations where there's small businesses that are deterred from or, or you know, get caught up in um, this policy and, and are, are decide that it's not worth their while to set up shop. So I, I think there should be some thought put to some separate pools. For example, um, I know it's been discussed that 
One of those pools might in fact be the existing vacant residential lots, uh, possibly a second pool for secondary suite consideration. Obviously that's gonna have to have some sort of a cap, um, but I think there needs to be a pool distinctly for these minor changes of use. Yes, in some cases they, they may in theory create uh, more water demand, but I think that should be allowed for. There should be some sort of a buffer or a, a pool for those, those sort of minor changes in use. And if that is addressed or the intent is for that to be addressed in the policy, that's great. Uh, it just hasn't been clear to date whether that is the intention. And if so, uh, I just want that to be very distinct and clear in the policy. So I hope I'm clear in, in my uh, comments. And if there's any questions, certainly I, I will be happy to clarify. But I, I appreciate your time and, and thank you for, uh, for hearing me. Okay, well, thank you, James. Uh, I think your points are were taken loud and clear. Uh, they were well made. Uh, Director Valentine, did you wanna comment on, on, on the questions raised? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. And thank you um, to Mr. Orr for uh, highlighting his comments. Um, I can confirm that uh, through the most iter uh, recent iteration of the capacity allocation policy that is proposed and was uh, posted along with the December 20th uh, council meeting agenda that there is a, a separate pool intended uh, specifically for those matters that don't require planning act applications and the two examples included um, in the policy currently are the existing vacant small residential lots, um, as mentioned by Mr. Orr, but as well those changes of use that he's referring to that uh, are, are minor in nature and don't require additional water capacity. So if there's a way to make that clearer, we would certainly welcome comments from Mr. Orr and uh, the development industry overall. Um, and uh, I also did want to um, highlight that secondary dwelling units or accessory residential units as they're also called are currently proposed to be exempted in their entirety from the policy. So there's, there's no need um, for a pool to be set aside uh, for those, um, for, for that type of development. Um, and lastly, I just did wanna take the opportunity to clarify um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Orr for speaking tonight that uh, the public meeting on January 24th that he referred to is specifically scoped to the zoning bylaw amendment. The larger discussion around the servicing capacity allocation strategy um, policy itself. Um, so a second round basically with the public and the development community is um, tracking to happen on uh, February 19th as our proposed date. We're just trying to ensure that uh, we can make that timeline work, but uh, there has been some confusion out in the public um, that the January 24th date is for the zoning bylaw and the early February date is uh, for the, the uh, capacity allocation policy itself. Council will remember we took three different approaches with the three different tools that were uh, presented. So staff are working hard to uh, try to increase that understanding in the public and this provides a perfect opportunity to uh, underscore those, those three, different, uh, three different paths that we're on today. Thank you, that's uh, helpful. All right, Deputy Clerk Dahl, would there be anyone else uh, who would like to address the committee tonight? Chair Hamlin, I'll call one last time. If there's anyone in the audience that would like to speak, if you could please raise the, uh, raise the hand, raise your hand feature at the bottom of the screen. And uh, that would be it for this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, committee, is there anyone who has any other business they would like to bring forward tonight? Seeing none, looks like we're ready for our German motion. Councillor Jeffrey, yes, we have a mover. Uh, all those in favor? Great, thank you so much to everyone tonight. That was a great meeting, thank you.